Hello everybody, this is a weather briefing for August 18th, 2023, and now let's get right into things. So, currently ongoing, we have a marginal risk in Arizona, mainly looking at a wind threat there with that one. And then we do have a severe risk tomorrow, it's not outlined by the SPC, but I believe there's potential for severe weather tomorrow, probably in Arizona, maybe southern Nevada, and parts of southeastern California. And then we have a bigger severe risk day, which is going to be Sunday. Um, I would I would be shocked if a slight risk does not get issued somewhere in here uh, tonight for this area, and they expand the marginal as well. Tornadoes, wind gusts, and hail all appear possible. Um, I don't know why, but the SPC only mentions severe gusts. Now, before we kind of go into things, let's kind of give a broader view of currently what Hurricane Hillary is doing. So, we're going to go to the National Hurricane Center, and we can see here, as we dive into the Eastern Pacific, Hurricane Hillary currently has winds of 130 miles per hour. Um, 12 hours, we are expecting this thing to weaken some. I wouldn't be surprised if some of the hurricane uh, recon... Uh, people uh, that find that come into the storm find that it's actually a little bit stronger than 130 mile per hour. Recon is currently traveling um, southwestward. They started their journey near Mobile, Alabama, or Mississippi, and they're now moving through Mexico, and they're going to get to the Outer Bands of Hillary very soon. Um, looking back at kind of the home page of... Um, Tropical tidbits, you can see Hillary is a huge, um, major hurricane with winds of 130 mile per hour. I mean, I would say this is all hurri or Hillary, and then this is all Hillary influenced up here. So lots of different stuff that kind of Hillary is um, controlling, per se. Um, and you can see it's got a well-defined eye on satellite, which is clearly right here. It did just go under a eyewall replacement cycle, and it finished it a good bit ago. Um, you can see it's a pretty strong storm on satellite, too. It doesn't really have any issues at this moment. You can see it was battling that eyewall replacement cycle still around 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, and now it is 10 p.m. Central Standard Time about five hours later. And we can see that this eyewall replacement cycle has been completed. I would not be or I'm I'm um kind of shocked that the hurricane center didn't downgrade this thing to a category three. Recon data only found about max winds of 95 knots, which would translate to a category two. But given that it did have uh, air, uh, what's it called? Flight winds of like 120 knots, I think recorded. It probably was a major hurricane still around 100 knots or so. But it definitely was a lower end cat three to upper end two when it was um getting that eyewall replacement cycle done, so maybe in the year-end post-review we'll get this thing. Now, I'm not an expert on hurricanes, I would say, at all. I would say my, not my specialty, but definitely my stronger side is um with severe weather. But you can see there's a very clear eyewall, and this thing's pretty symmetrical too, which is, is a good sign that of a stronger storm. You can see um, some stronger convection on the outer bands over here. Probably should get a different color out. And... You can also see pretty large system overall. You can get a satellite here, visible satellite, and you can see that thing kind of churn. And now here it is, what it looks like right now. You don't, you don't get the normal view of visible satellite because of the time of the day, but you can see there is a very clear eye feature right here. It's impacting some islands right now, and then this is the southern part of Baja, California. And Hurricane Hillary, um, let's go back to Hurricane Hillary and look at the cone. It's going to bring hurricane impacts to Baja, California. If not, maybe make landfall in this area right here on the Baja. There are hurricane watches up to the California border with Baja, California. And then tropical storm warnings for southwestern and southern California with this system. And this is a very large system. You can see it has a pretty large area of hurricane force winds around that dot, and then it has a very large area of tropical storm force winds, so not really anything to mess around with, and um, this is going to be a pretty impactful storm. And you can see, looks like it's going to make landfall on 
uh, California or the northern Baja Peninsula between probably between six and midnight on Sunday. Uh, this would be mountain daylight time. So or yeah, mountain daylight time for now. Um. But yeah, let's look at the HRRR and kind of how Hillary impacts the pattern. Um, and if you do hear a background noise, my AC just kicked in for my room, so sorry about that. Um, you may hear that noise periodically, but you can see here already, we can see Hillary um, is pretty far off the screen here. But there is a trough in California right now, um, or off the coast. There's this upper level low that's bringing on some stronger flow into California, and this brought isolated to scatter or this brought really scattered thunderstorms across portions of california today and also into arizona generally in here and this actually brought a severe weather event too um not sure how many reports there's been so far probably a lot of the reports are going to be from that new england tornado event that was earlier today um there was a pretty decent tornado event there in New England. At least five tornadoes confirmed. There'll probably be six to twelve that end up getting confirmed. There's an EF two as well, so pretty rare to see that. But no no reports, but there were several severe thunderstorm warnings earlier today associated with that trough. And uh we could probably look into observed soundings and see exactly why. Oops, I accidentally clicked a different area. So Go to Phoenix. Yeah, and I mean, you can see why you have this inverted V profile, which is pretty common for that area during the summertime. You do have 20 knots of deep layer shear, which is enough to uh, really get those stronger storms. And you have MU cape of about a thousand joules per kilogram, so it's working that instability profile there. Southern Cali, um, not as much. There's probably, I'm gonna choose a different date. Probably could actually get something out of this Yuma sounding here, and yeah, you do. So you have a lot more instability available earlier in the day when those storms are stronger. 100 degree temperatures with 60 degree dew points, so relatively moist, especially in the mid levels here. And then you had those very dry um, lower levels, which is classic for downbursts. But this hodograph did support a isolated supercell mode as well, which we did have a couple supercells with mid level rotation there, but wouldn't produce anything because of that drier surface area. But as we can see here, Hillary's influence on this trough is actually going to be pretty significant. And we can see that its influence starts tomorrow. There will probably be a severe weather event. Um, Not tomorrow, there probably will be a severe weather event tomorrow in eastern California into Nevada, Utah area. And maybe a severe weather event in the central plains too, maybe? We'll see about this though. Um, But yeah, you can see Hillary is going to start to weaken tomorrow as it encounters a little bit lower sea surface temperatures um, as it gradually gets further to the north. It has a window right now where it can strengthen and probably will get back up to lower to middle in category 4 strength. But we'll stop this at hour 24 and you can see Hillary is uh, drawing up that moisture and look at 700 millibar and you can see there's already stronger winds starting to really get into that area as well. You also have a short wave across the Midwest, 700 millibars, but storms are unlikely to initiate there due to a pretty stout capping inversion in um, the middle levels, as you can see here, or lower levels, as you can see here. Um, but the Midwest will also be dealing with dangerous heat, which we will talk about briefly later. So tomorrow will mainly be a tornado risk day in um, the Baja California risk area, but there can't, there, um, sorry, I can't, I keep mumbling my speak, or messing up my speaking but i wouldn't out a tornado or two especially in the southeast california into southwest arizona tomorrow as you do have that stronger area of um upper level or lower level flow like it's in there mixed layer cape values are a thousand plus joules per kilogram by this point too and you do have some stronger storms ongoing but let's get that radar loop in here or future radar loop gener uh, by the h triple r and note that the h triple r does over mix environment sometimes and a lot of the time during the summer. So it looks like there probably will be some storms in the morning tomorrow, but that shouldn't really affect stuff. Around um, in the probably mid-morning in Arizona and California, we start to see scattered thunderstorms develop, especially in eastern California, probably when Hillary and that trough really start to interact. And some of these could become pretty strong too. Um, if we look at soundings in southeastern California here, we can see you have that inverted V profile already starting to set up in deep layer shear of 15 to 20 knots there. Only 14 in that sounding and relatively steep lapse rates will probably create a risk of some sort for some stronger storms. 
looking a little bit further to the west, we can see that's the case as well. Potentially a supercell structure too. You have these mini supercell like photographs there, but the 20 not to deep layer shear will probably limit the, the, the higher potential with that. And then as we get into the midday, we can definitely see um, the severe risk starting to increase in southwestern Arizona. Again, pretty similar profiles to what there were out west. I would be I would be shocked if we didn't have a severe weather tomorrow with a profile like that. I mean, you have a thousand plus uh, joules per kilogram of cape, and you also have steep lapse rates throughout the profile, which means you're buoyant and unstable, and those updrafts can rise rather quickly. And we start to see kind of this blob of convection move northward. Um, as we move throughout the day, you can see the profiles are still not great. And then as we get toward the evening hours, we can see these storms kind of die off a bit. Um, might get a couple of rounds of some weaker storms in there, but the big stuff won't come until later in the day. And we'll talk about that <clears throat> right now. We'll stop this at uh, hour 42 and we'll go to the broad sector of the whole United States. So you can see Hillary is located right here in the central part of the Baja Peninsula, and this is going to be 12 p.m. Mountain stand, mountain Daylight Time, not standard. By this point, Hillary has merged with that trough off Baja uh, California, and that trough is pushed northward. This has greatly influenced the middle-level flow in this area, and it's starting to shear the system apart. Now, since it's moving rather fast, the system won't have too much time to weaken, so it'll probably be a high-end tropical storm to low on hurricane when it landfalls. You can see there's 50 to 60 plus knot flow across um, Arizona and actually into, um, a real, actually there's really fit 40 plus knot a belt from this system all the way into Canada. So really in here you have an area of enhanced flow. We have one short wave that's like located in here, I would say. And this is gonna create a few storms uh, in the evening across Wyoming, um, maybe Colorado, Nebraska, South Dakota too. There is another short wave that's over Illinois, Indiana here, and another one that's over Nebraska and South Dakota here. Now those short waves in those areas probably will not be uh, able to produce much convection because of how strong this ridge is. You have this strong ridge of high pressure that's building over Kansas and Missouri that's going to really shunt thunderstorm development and really uh, cap the surface out there. But what it does is it creates a rather anomalous severe weather setup for the southwest, which is, you don't really see this that often and this amount of flow happen at this time of the year either. Um, we can also see 700 millibar winds are going to be extremely strong in that area as well with widespread 40 plus knots and even areas approaching 60 if not reaching 60 knots there. What this does is we get a few bands of supercells to form on the northeast quadrant of the hurricane as it moves inland. If you look at AT&Z, we can see um, already starting to see some stronger mixed layer Cape Valleys there build up in southwest Arizona. And you can see the main event really hasn't moved in yet as those photographs are still a little bit smaller. But you can see there, as you get to 20Z, really anywhere in here is going to have a tornado threat. Um... The greatest tornado threat, though, will probably exist down in here. You're going to have more enhanced wind shear. You're going to have more enhanced instability. And taking a sounding in front of that convection, you can see a very enlarged photograph with lots of streamwise vorticity. You can also see rather strong instability profiles with mixed layer cape of 1,500 and surface base cape of uh, 3,000 joules per kilogram. One of the only problems is this mid-level warm nose here that does perk up, which might disrupt some thunderstorms from forming, but you do have those very strong low-level lapse rates. So you'll be able to get updrafts to accelerate, and then they'll probably stick there for a while before actually being able to realize the instability profile. Um, you can see there's going to be multiple kind of strings of these supercells across Arizona, and looking at the parameter space with STP, we can see... Values are going to be in between 1 and 4, or really th 4 widespread. Anything above 4 is going to be cherry-picked by the storms. But we can see there's a tor there's an environment uh, favorable for tornadoes generally in here. Um, at least at 21Z, which would be th uh, probably 2 o'clock Pacific, I think. Um, one of the main things that's driving this is the rather strong level of instability combined with, again, that rather strong level of wind shear. You got 100 plus 3 cape and 60 plus 700 millibar flow 
kind of riding in that area. So rather strong. Um, you're not going to have those middle elapse rates again, as we talked about, but you're going to have very strong low level wind shear, 200 service to one kilometer um, storm relative felicity. Deep layer shear is also going to be abundant, especially in California, 40 plus knots there, which will definitely get the job done. And when picking a profile in Southern California there ahead of those storms, we can see Again, rather buoyant profile, sorry for the contamination, but rather buoyant profile, especially in the low levels, and overall moderate instability will be in place. We'll see if the storms can realize it. Um, you can see <clears throat> not really too many UH tracks with this run, which is a little bit of a concern as the storms aren't able to realize that instability environment, partly because of that warm nose. Looking into Arizona, um, further east, the low-level jet won't be as prevalent over there, but you will still have a severe risk in so central and eastern um arizona if this run happened um the main tornado risk though would probably be located generally in here if this run happened so western arizona southwest utah um southern uh los or southern nevada and then eastern and southern california so looks like la is probably going to get out of the tornado risk for now because um they're not gonna they're gonna have a lot more of that heavy rain risk and we will talk about that in a second but yeah, that tornado threat will extend into um, southwest Utah and eastern Nevada. Um, you can see there there will still be that warm nose, so you're not going to get as much of that instability realized, but you're still going to have very large totographs across the region with 0 to 3 kilometer SRH of 300 and effective SRH of 300 as well. Still steep low level lapse rates, so you'll be able to get those low levels to accelerate. 3 Cape is going to be still on the high side with that area, northwestern Arizona. There again, still have that higher 3K pull. Um, and by 0Z, zero zero, we can see the rainfall that this thing's put down over the course of the run. And we can see there's some areas in California that have already picked up 10 inches of rain nearly. Um, and this is the thing that's driving the flash flooding risk, which I haven't talked about yet. But if we go look on this page, we have two different high risks of flash flooding across California. I would not be surprised if these are expanded upon and they get connected with a new update probably later tonight or tomorrow morning. One high risk here and one high risk here. So lots to talk about. There's more flash flooding potential as well with this thing. And then looking at a model like the NAMS is going to really output throughout the whole cyclone. And we can see widespread 3 plus inches. Um, the NAM 3K is going to give you a little bit more of a view and you can see some areas pick up 10 plus inches, though, which would not surprise me. And widespread getting 2 plus inches. And this is going to be way too much rain for everything to handle. And then as we get toward 12Z, we can see the system moves into um, land. It's all the way up in Nevada at this point. And it probably will still carry a tornado threat into Nevada, although that risk is probably not going to be too high at this point. Yeah, instability values really start to decrease as you get further to the north. But looks like the tornado risk will probably still be around 4Z, and we can look at the NAM 3 kilometer here um, and get its take on what's going to happen reflectivity-wise with this system. And then we'll move over to the central plains and kind of talk about that severe risk. <clears throat> but as we can see here, um, the NAM 3 kilometer has... Um, a severe risk and then we can see it again starts tomorrow morning and then into the afternoon tomorrow Saturday uh, It has this higher severe risk tomorrow in parts of southern central Arizona not far from Phoenix And I can see why when you have large photographs like that So there will be a tornado or two tomorrow possibly uh, Across Arizona if we can get the right ingredients to set up damaging winds and hail are pretty much a guarantee with any storms that can really get robust. The M3 kilometer has destabilization stifled, though, because of the stronger amounts of instability that it really delays with that. But you still get those very enlarged photographs, and with that stronger amount of wind shear, you still have a pretty significant threat. And we'll kind of stop this at hour 46. It's a little bit slower with the system, I would say. Um, we can see kind of the ingredients are not as prevalent as they are on the HRRR does have a severe event all the way up in Utah there. It has definitely has a severe event here in Arizona and um, California with the system, but it has instability being a pretty big major red uh, flag 
So probably the bus scenario is you only get a tornado or two and more damaging wind gusts because of the instability being lower than what some of the higher res models were showing. Um, now let's talk about that severe risk that's going to exist in the central plains. So we're going to be up into the north central U.S. sector for this one, and we can see here HRRR does fire off a supercell along that warm frontal zone um, on the top of the ridge there on Sunday, and you can see there's a short wave across eastern Wyoming which will provide a severe risk. It is located right in here, really. Or actually, it's like here. I probably butchered the placement again, but you can see that's going to probably generate a couple supercell storms. Um, and these storms will be capable of mainly producing large hail and damaging wind gusts. Um, the, the model doesn't really have too much low level instability developing, although you probably are over mixing this, so you'll probably have dew points into the 60s, um, maybe low 70s, but I'd probably say middle to lower 60s. Um, I don't know if that would be enough to get a tornado risk still, but you'll probably have structured storms. Um, and this is all influenced because of Hillary um, influencing that jet and really strengthening it. Um, looking at the RAP, the RAP has more instability into Wyoming. And I would say that's probably a more realistic solution. Um, you can see here profiles in eastern Wyoming are pretty capped, but as you get toward 22Z, I wouldn't be surprised if you get a storm or two to go along that tongue of instability there in eastern Wyoming. As you can see here, the capping is a lot less at this point. Um, it's still there, which would probably reduce the tornado threat because of that warm nose being there. But you will have a threat for large hail and damaging winds um, because of that drier low level air. Now one thing that will kind of hurt this event is that there is a very dry air in the mid levels and low levels combined, which could really suppress storm development. So we'll really have to watch that. Um, if a storm does pop up in like Illinois or something, that would be pretty interesting, but it doesn't look like that'll happen because, um, uh, Illinois is right under the ridge. Um, now let's briefly talk about the heat, um, we'll load up the new NAM run and kind of talk about that. So there's going to be a lot of very high dew points across the Midwest on Sunday, which will mean that your heat is quite strong and I'm actually gonna use pivotal weather or college of DuPage for this because pivotal weather is being clunky and slow right now. College of DuPage, it's your time to sun it's your time to shine. I cannot speak today. Do they do heat indexes? I don't know. They might not. They might just do temperature, which is okay. But you can see here, um Saturday's going to be extremely hot across portions of kind of Kansas, Iowa, Minnesota, Nebraska, California, really a lot of the central United States. That heat, though, will just grow Sunday um, and max out in Kansas there. Illinois is probably going to have some nasty heat indexes, though. Temperatures are going to be in the 90s, but you're going to have dew points in the 80s. And if we look at Pivotal weather, probably should load up Pivotal again um, just because you get the heat indexes better on Pivotal, which is annoying. I wish College of DuPage had heat indexes, but they don't, so gotta use clunky and slow Pivotal weather. Pivotal weather is a great website, but when you're not in the best Wi-Fi, it can be quite slow, which is irritating. But you can see, uh, taking a look at our heat indexes, um, yeah, they are extremely high. Maxed out, actually, in um, Kansas there, Nebraska. Missouri and Iowa. A lot of Illinois will be dealing with significant heat indexes. Really anywhere in the central U.S. will be. Places like Nebraska, Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, Indiana, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama. Did I just voice cracked? Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia. And then more dangerously in Louisiana, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and Kansas, and Missouri. But you can see the most dangerous area is probably going to be Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Kansas, Nebraska, Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin, Missouri. So if you um, have errands to run, I would run them tomorrow, um, especially if you live in like the Midwest, like Illinois. Tomorrow, the heat index will probably be pretty bad across most of Iowa. But if you live in like Illinois, Tennessee, Kentucky, like eastern Missouri, um, parts of eastern um 
Wisconsin, more central Wisconsin, and then to the Ohio Valley and mid-Atlantic regions. Tomorrow's heat index won't be as bad as it will be on Sunday, but Missouri, you're kind of you're kind of screwed at this point. <laughs> Your heat index is going to be pretty bad. But yeah, you, you can see the dew points are going to be extremely high, as what the NAM projects at least. Um, widespread mid to upper 70 dew points with low 80s in there as well. And then that doesn't go away for Monday either. It stays for Monday, drags itself a little bit further to the south, and you can see significant heat indexes build up across Illinois. Again, I'm trying to find where the heat indexes are. Yeah. So, again, significant heat indexes from South Dakota now, Minnesota, southward, and eastward too. So, pretty much every single state even. Arizona's even going to have pretty strong heat. Um, temperatures overall are going to be hot, 90s in most spots as well. And then as we move on to probably the GFS, because the GFS itself is going to suck with heat. Um, we can see here, Tuesday's looking hot whenever it loads. Come on. I pressed that. Okay, Tuesday's looking hot. Potentially very, or, yeah, very hot in central Illinois there. We're probably going to be breaking some records in some areas. Yeah. And, you know, we should probably run through this. <clears throat> the record breaking thing before we end this video we'll run we'll run through that because records are probably going to be broken in multiple spots um and this is a little bit of an outdated gfs run but probably starting tomorrow we might see records broken in some areas we'll see about that record cool maybe in like california there and then again record very very high heat kansas and missouri a lot stronger than normal and that moves kind of eastward into Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, maybe Illinois for the next day. Wednesday, that moves itself even eastward. Or actually, that's Tuesday. Wednesday, it's even more east. Thursday. Friday, it moves itself southeast. And then Saturday as well. And we'll probably start to see that area of temperatures cool down. But here's kind of a loop, so... Okay, so here's sun, uh, yeah, Sunday, very hot temperatures across a lot of areas there. Monday, again, the same deal. Tuesday, and then Wednesday, it starts to move a little bit eastward um, into Illinois there. And then Thursday, a lot of areas on the GFS have mean temperatures of 100 degrees. Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, Probably, what, Southeast South Dakota there, Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana. Like, a lot of the central U.S. have states with mean temperatures into the hundreds for um, Thursday. And then Friday, the cold front might slide east southward. It might not as well. We'll see. Saturday, it's definitely going to slide itself southward. It's really going to be a cool front. You'll still be in the 80s after it, but you're not going to be as miserable. Saturday, you'll still see those hotter temperatures, and then the ridge might build up again on, on early next week. So it's just going to be miserable. Not early next week, but the week after that. But thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you have sticked through this, it's 30 minutes long on my first forecast video in a while. And Andrew's out.